come. Gucci to the state, serve in the borough. Who's doing red flags? I'm a most in the color. Who's on push, drunk, my slur? Yes, ahead of a new BBC uh, Scotland documentary about his life, we hear from Scottish rapper Stevie Creed about his attempts to make it big in New York and with a number of businesses putting measures in place to ensure... Mornings with Key Adams on BBC Radio Scotland. Now, Stevie Creed uh, grew up being told that Scottish kids couldn't rap. So at 19, he set off from his hometown of Edinburgh to New York to prove them all wrong. He now goes by the Subriquet, I love that word, uh, the Brooklyn Scotsman, and he is the subject of a BBC Scotland documentary by the same name, which airs tomorrow night. Uh, good morning to you, Stevie. Good morning, Kay. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well indeed. That's cool, the Brooklyn Scotsman. That, that's a good nickname, isn't it? Yeah, it's got a good ring to it. I think it seems to stick in people's minds. So. <laughs> so, so where did you where did you earn that one then, or who gave it to you? Well, that happened when I was in Brooklyn about ten years ago, and it just kind of originated. I was in a, a boxing gym, and they started calling me the Brooklyn Scotsman. So, yeah, it kind of stemmed from there. It was. It was it had a nice ring to it, so it just stuck to me. So you were nineteen when you headed to New York, yeah. Yeah, I was 19 years old, so went out there and just by myself to try and learn more about the world. I mean, a pretty big deal at 19 just to head to New York, just come kind of almost speculatively. Was it to learn how to rap? Was that your kind of main focus? Um, no, I mean, actually, I did music from about 12 years old, so I did music, but I was also boxing at the time, so I went over there for boxing originally. And uh, the reason I went there uh, was because a lot of the best fighters were coming from that area of Brooklyn. And I just wanted to kind of test myself and see how, how good I thought I was. You know, I thought I was all right, but you go out there and it's a, it's a tough place to make it. And I was also doing music, but I didn't really have a lot to say. I was, I was writing a lot of fancy things, and, but I didn't have anything driving me to write about stuff and when I got to Brooklyn I was seeing the big skyscrapers and every day I was experiencing things so I just started writing and the music kind of took off out there because they really pushed me and said that the accent was something that was great and they loved it which was a kind of a revelation for me because I was told from when I was very young that, you know, you know, it's quite good, but you're Scottish, you can't do that. And then I went out there and they were the ones that pushed me and said, no, you, you need to do this. This is important because you have a lot to say and also you stand out. So I was lucky they really pushed me and elevated me to have the confidence and belief in myself that I could do something out there. And it's, it's, it was interesting. It was quite a, a surreal experience that changed my life, really. I mean, it sounds as if you found a really kind of supportive group of people then. I mean, having landed on your own as a 19-year-old. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the the best thing about it. And, I mean, anything in life is about the people that we, we see. And when I went over there, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any friends or family. I'd, I'd never been to America before. So I was a little bit apprehensive about going there, but I had this... In a, in a way, a false bravado. I had to create this false bravado to go over there and, and act tough and act like I was confident when maybe I wasn't as confident in, inside me as I thought I was. But when I got there and I was around people that believed in me and, and they saw what I was doing out there by myself, they, they, they took me in and showed me around and also uh, took care of me and, and just made sure I was okay. And they were the ones that kept telling me, you know, you're going to be big, you're going to take over the world. It's, it's a different mentality over there as well. Every, in America, they're, so, they're excited about everything. So in <laughs> America, they get so excited about everything. And I was over there and they were so excited. And wherever I would go, people were really fascinated with Scotland and, and, and the culture in Scotland and what it was like over here. So I loved it. I mean, I became more interesting overnight and I'm very proud to be Scottish. So it was something that I was happy to talk about and it was great. And they, they really, are the, re the reason that the Brooklyn Scotsman is something that I'm called and I'm proud to represent is because the people out there changed my life and the, the music kind of represents that. And I wouldn't really be here if it wasn't for them doing this and I wouldn't have anything really as special to say that, that they told me. So I think that's been a, a good thing for me. Um, so what was Brooklyn like then when you just kind of landed there? I mean, it's a fairly kind of almost uh, 
mythological place, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Brooklyn is, I think, it's also hard to grasp the size of it. I mean, Brooklyn has 2.5 million people, so that's just one borough of the five boroughs in New York, and it's, it's a huge place, and going out there, I, I, I went straight to a motel, uh, the first was the first place I went, called the Galaxy Motel, and it was the middle of the afternoon, and I, I just thought it was it was meant to be a nice motel. The reason I went there was because it was close to the boxing gym, and it was the only place I could really stay. And it turned out to be, um, you know, there was a lot of prostitution and, and stuff going on there. But for me, I didn't really know that. I found out a few days later that it was renowned for that. And all over Brooklyn, that was like the most famous uh, <laughs> motel and gave me a little bit of street credibility and stuff. But I think that was the first night when I got in and sat on my bed and, and stuff was going on. There was, you know, there was orgies happening and things happening all around me. It was really surreal and a lot of noise. And I was just a teenager, so I, I picked up the pen and I started writing. And this was before I even went to the gym. So the music was something that kind of really inspired me out there. And, yeah, I, I don't know, I had a lot to talk about. And, yeah, at Brooklyn, when I got there, it was just a mix of so many different cultures and creeds and people, and everyone's so uh, confident and everyone's so... Uh, honest and upfront, and I think that's New York in general. In New York, if somebody doesn't like you, they're not gonna, you know, yeah. talk behind your back. They just say, "I don't like you," and they walk on, and that's it. They don't hold it in them. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, we have a habit of sometimes keeping that inside us. Whereas in America, they're they're very upfront. If if they think you, you're you, you say something wrong, they'll tell you. They don't like your music, they'll tell you. So it's a tough environment to earn respect in. But I always felt that. If I could earn respect in New York, then I'd, I'd respect myself for the rest of my life. So that's why I went there. And, and did you just take that all in your, your stride? I mean, you know, it's 10 years ago now, but, you know, 19 years of age, never been in the States before, straight out of Edinburgh, you know, you're in some dodgy motel in downtown Brooklyn. Um, you know, were you not terrified at the time? Yeah, I mean, I think when I came uh, to the, the motel, I was quite scared because there was... There was like gangs and stuff in the area, but for me, I think I had a false persona I created because I was prepared mentally to go out there beforehand. And I mean, boxing is very psychological as well, so I was kind of preparing to go into the boxing gym where all eyes were going to be on me. And I, I compared that sort of system to my, my life and, and the world. So if you compare New York to a boxing gym and you're walking into that environment, you have to have this kind of front that is a, a coat of armor you put on you to try and not not necessarily survive, but just people won't take advantage of you because they, they will out there if you're not confident and you don't believe in yourself, they will, they, will, they can't understand that. So I guess I had this false sense of who I was and this false confidence, but going out there, I gradually gained uh, true confidence. And I thought I was a man going out there, but I was a boy and I came back a man. And that was really, yeah, it was, I experienced a lot of things which, which changed my perception of the world, that changed the way I look at the world, that changed the way the world looks at me. And I, didn't, I don't think I took it in my stride. I just think I was, I, I felt like I was in a different uh, parallel universe, another parallel universe. It was a, a really strange thing. And sometimes it was hard for me to separate my dreams from my reality. Mm -hmm. And I remember waking up one morning and I'd been to the boxing gym it was the first time I went, and this was a, a few days prior, and I woke up and I couldn't remember if that was a dream or if it was my real life, so I had this card from the gym and I checked and I said, yeah, I did go there because my reality was crazier than my dreams. And that was that was when I realized that my, my real life was, was becoming more interesting than, than my dreams. And I, I guess I was lucky I had this this weird mentality back then but now looking back at it and also being comfortable in Scotland you think did that happen and even telling you stories or talking about it sometimes I don't believe it myself and the people I'm talking to it maybe sounds surreal mm. but people out there assure me it happened and I have, I have that habit of telling people stories that have happened and they know it's true and I know it's true but I still don't believe it you know it's, it's a strange thing <laughs> Did, so did the boxing work out? Um, well, no, I mean, when I went out there, I went just, you know, to train and I was, 
I thought I was alright as a boxer, you know, but it's quite tough out there, and, and the music was what actually took over. So if I was good enough to, you know, be a champion, I probably would have been a champion. But I think boxing gave me a lot of other things like discipline, and it, it helped give me the confidence in life. But it was the music that really took over because. Out there, people were saying you have a unique story and you sound different, and this is something that separates you from other people. And I felt like I could really uh, maybe make a difference because I had stuff to say and I had many different words to speak on on things that I'd seen. And I think that's why the music's important to me. And I, I pushed forward with that. And also, New York does pull you in many different directions. So. Going out there for boxing was my initial thing, and I was in the gym, and I was just there all the time. But then I started venturing into other things, and I, I got involved in modelling for a slight period. And that's when I started spending time in Manhattan, and you see a different, uh, diverse uh, sort of mm. section of the community. And it was that was a different world, around people with lots of money, and Wall Street people, and you see different sides to New York. It has everything out there, and there's so many things to do in New York. There's so much opportunity that I was out partying and doing things, and I wasn't really disciplined to be a fighter uh, back then. So, but I'm, I'm glad, and I still am. I'm, I'm, I'm hugely passionate about boxing, and I love the sport. But I just back then I wasn't disciplined enough to to train every single day and just be focused on boxing because. If you want to be a professional, that's all you have to do. It's, it's, uh, I commend anyone who does it because it's a very tough profession. Hmm. But has music taken over now? Yeah, yeah, music's taken over. I think it's uh, from about when I went out there when I was 19. I'd say from when I hit 21, that was when the music just uh, took over completely. So it was, uh, yeah, and that's been it since, since then. So I've done the music and theatre and, and many different things and it's good I enjoy writing it's like therapy so even in moments now with this uh, ambiguous nature of the coronavirus and things that are going on it, it gives me a release I can write things and I think everybody in life they just need a release they need something that they can do to take their mind off of things and express themselves and that's that's what it gave me so I'm very very thankful for that. Are you still rapping? Um, yeah, I'm still I still write. I've got my album coming out this this year, so I've got that's uh, Concrete Jungle, and that'll be coming out this year in a few months. And you know the documentary's coming out tomorrow, which is quite exciting for yeah, me. And, on yeah. BBC Scotland, uh, ten o'clock tomorrow night. Yeah. Yeah, BBC Scotland at 10 p.m. and it's it's, yeah, it's got a, a lot of good response so far, and people that have seen it, it's uh, they get to see see my story and and what happened, and I think hopefully people get entertainment from it, and just during this this dark time, hopefully it's a little bit of uh, hope or a release, and mm. it gives people just a little bit of a distraction from all the madness that's going on and and the uncertainty in the world. Yeah. So and yeah, it's uh, it's good. Are you home for good? Oh, well, actually, I, I was scheduled to go out and marry my friends this month. So I was meant to be marrying uh, my friends in America. I was going to be the, the yeah. guy who did the ceremony. All right. <laughs> yeah, but that's obviously been scuppered with the coronavirus. So I'm, I'm due to go out there definitely next year anyway for that. Um, to New York but yeah I'm, I'm kind of I mean Scotland's my home and, and I'm proud of that but in New York there's just so much opportunity out there and it really brings out the best in me and I think the pacing out there is so fast I, I, it's the way that my mind works and, and sometimes here it's hard for me to adjust to the pacing in Scotland because mm -hmm. over there it's like you're right, you want to do something ah, let's do it we'll do it now whereas here it's like right we'll think about it you know we'll have a cup of tea we'll have a meeting we'll do it. and it takes a bit slower everything's a bit slower and a bit more relaxed here but over there it's like 100 miles per hour every minute you're doing all these different things so I do kind of uh, miss that element of it but it's good to be in Scotland uh, see my family and my mum obviously misses me and stuff so it's good to 
to come mm. back and uh, things like that. You know, she's a worrier all the time. And she's when I first went out there, I told her I was going for two weeks and ended up staying a lot longer than that. So <laughs> it's good to come back and, and see the family. Yeah, and I'm sure she'll enjoy seeing your story on on the screen tomorrow night as well. Um, Stevie, thanks very much for, for speaking to us this morning. It's, it's a fascinating tale. Um, so you can see the Brooklyn Scotsman uh, tomorrow night on BBC Scotland at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, cheers, Stevie. Our planet matters.